So I will first want to start to talk a bit on the Hatsa language, like very briefly. Um, there's on the upper part of the screen, you can see the two codes um, in case you want to look for it further in any database. And uh, well, it's a, a language that is spoken by around 1,000, uh, 6,000 speakers in the Lake Yasi in North Tanzania. And um, it's besides the high numbers, like 6,000, 6, it is a threatened or endangered language, um, mainly due to language shift to other languages like Sukuma or, and Swahili in the northwest of the country. As for the language family, uh, it's currently classified as isolate, although it was formerly classified as Khoisan, and there are no dialects and just regional vocabulary, mainly due to Bantu loans in areas of, of high bilingualism. Now we know a bit on um, the language, I would like to talk about laryngeal contrast and precisely on why they are important. Uh, there are central phonetic parameter to define consonant inventories and there's still a lot to do. So um, what range of laryngeal contrasts are found in the languages and which theoretical model uh, it's more appropriate are still questions that need to have a definite answer. So um, I would like to first to start talking about uh, what briefly, what does the theory, the type, the typology say about them? Uh, so if a language has one set stops, uh, then it would be as Chubach, non-aspirated and voiceless. Uh, if it has a two-way contrast, then the, the, the contrast element will be in the voicing, and this can be uh, in, let's say, in aspirating languages, such as English, with one of the stops being aspirated or true voicing, like Spanish, when there's just uh, no aspiration. In a three-way contrast, then we will find plain voiceless, aspirated voiceless, and um, voice as, for example, Thai or Vietnamese. So um, well, uh, the, the problem here is that this classification leaves no room for languages with more than a three-way contrast, as for example, Bangla, as we can see in that uh, uh, table, but also for languages that have different combinations of those contrasts. And this uh, was something that was uh, researched by Laura Downing, that she's, I think, here today. And um, yeah, this presentation is heavily um, inspired by one of her talks that we had last year. So what about Hatsa? What can we say about uh, the contrast? So uh, as for stops, there is a three-way contrast in pulmonic that is non-nasal stops. Um, however, the adjectives were not taken into consideration. And it just said that these have a higher uh, voice onset time measures than the aspirated stops, although it's classified as non-significant. And for the pre-nasalized stops, there is a two-way contrast, uh, but it does not follow the, the typology expected rules. So we find an aspirated and a plain voiceless set. However, in this article, there is no data or analysis, so I can further explain. And then as for the clicks, uh, they consider that aspiration does not play a significant role because there is a high variability in the bold uh, measurements. Uh, there is a two groups in initial and post-nasal have way different results than intervocalic context. But uh, a similar difference is also found for the bilabial um, stops. Uh, and anyway, aspiration is marked as phonological. Recent studies uh, have shown that um, aspiration might play a role indeed in the click system. And they classify the four types of Hatsa clicks with the following accompaniments. Uh, so the bilabial uh, only appears by itself. Lateral and alveolar can appear by themselves, but as well with other accompaniments. Uh, aspiration and nasalization appears in all of them. Um, only dental and alveolar have glottal, although it can appear with nasalization in dental and uh, lateral. Um, under this slide, aspiration is justified in terms of phonetical gesture. That means that the back of the tongue moves away more slowly from the vellum and it generates than the aspirated clicks. 
So as we have seen, Hadza has the properties needed to test three-way contrast theories, and there are still a number of unresolved or problematic issues regarding um, aspiration and nasalization. So the research questions of my paper are, what laryngeal contrasts are actually found in the system of stops and clicks in Hadza? Uh, which are the phonetic correlates of this contrast? And which differences, if any, are there when, con when considering pre-nasalization as a variable? Uh, so first things first, what I did was building a corpus based on the uh, materials found in the Endangered Languages Archive for the Hadza language. Uh, building on previous material from uh, Bonisense and uh, from uh, recent material of uh, the Hatsa community members, Andrew Harvey and Richard Criscombe. I found around 600 samples of um, the ones that were interesting um, for my research. And uh, out of those, around 500 were pulmonic, non-nasal, and uh, 145 were uh, nasal. I didn't take into consideration the labialized velar stops. I mean, I did analyze the data, but uh, they repeat the same pattern as the non-labialized counterparts. So I didn't include them here. And there's um, still, uh, I, I still need to carry the analysis for the bilabial click and the ejective bilabial because I couldn't find them in my actual corpus. And I'm uh, waiting maybe to uh, find um, them eventually. And yeah, but anyway, I try to make a, a, as balanced as possible. Uh, so I include both women and men, uh, inter-initial and intervocalic con context with those exceptions that, yeah, I still need to um, work on them and find them. It's uh, ongoing uh, work. Uh, so uh, about the analysis, what I did was that I took into account six different uh, parameters, measurements, and three of them, those three uh, are the ones um, about voicing, the ones that are supposed to shed light on voicing. Uh, the first one is the classical voice onset time, um, in which uh, it's useful up to signaling up to a three-way uh, contrast, uh, in which voice will be uh, uh, characterized by a long negative uh, bot, and then voiceless will be a positive vote uh, with the difference of short lag and long lag, depending if it's an aspirated or aspirated. I also consider, uh, since it's only useful up to a three-way contrast, I consider extended bot because um, it could provide information for voiced aspirated stops and consonant induced F0, uh, since this value was used uh, for other African click languages as Zulu, and it seemed to have very good results. Uh, with this value, we can see that the uh, vowel that follows the consonant has different F0 uh, fundamental frequency um, measurements depending on the uh, type of the consonant that precedes it. So the aspirated consonant will have the highest, and then it will um, obtain lower values until the voice stop that will obtain the lowest. Uh, however, I also considered um, voice quality since aspiration often comes with breathy voice. So for that, I took two parameters. The first one is the difference between the amplitudes of the first harmonic and the second in the Fourier spectrum, because it is an index of glottal constriction. That is that it measures the proportion of openness that it's in the glottal cycle. And um, since breathing uh, is more open than model voice, as we can see in that um, diagram, I would expect for um, mm, to, to, to obtain much higher levels than um, in aspiration than in the rest. Uh, same thing here, the sexual peak prominence is also um, a voice quality um, measure. But in this case, it's a bit more abstract. So I need to explain briefly some key concepts. Uh, first thing, Sepstro comes from Sepstrom, and that is the result of computing the inverse real transform. The peak indicates the presence of a fundamental frequency. And then the prominence is how far that peak emerges from the background. So ZPP is an index of harmonics to noise ratio. 
what I will state is since a highly periodic signal uh, shows a well-defined harmonic structure, a more prominent central peak, uh, a higher central peak prominence. And therefore, if breathy voice is present, CPP should be lower. Lastly, I took into account the uh, first nasal form maturation and its intensity to measure pre-nasalization that appears uh, in the um, nasal murmur. But I couldn't add those in my results yet because I'm still analyzing that one. So it's not finished. But I anyway um, put some information about it in um, the stops. So um, as for the results, what I found is that for both the stops and clicks, um, it was the, the results were, were, were close to what was expected. But however, there are some irregularities. So um, in the stops, the first one that I want to point out is the adjective K, the adjective Villar, uh, because it has uh, way too similar vote um, with the aspiration. But uh, however, if we take a closer look uh, in the results, we can see that the adjective has more polarized realization. That means that has lower minimums and higher maximums than the aspirated that stays uh, completely uh, stable. Uh, then if we take into account the CF0 as a parameter, we can see that there is a lot uh, that is marked. And that means because it's a little bit more problematic, uh, but I, um, it's uh, explicable through uh, voice qualities, at least in the bilevial and the Villar set. Um, because we can see that that uh, responds to what was expected. Uh, the only one that is completely messed up, if I can say so, uh, is the alveolar one, in which not even voice quality can uh, explain the results of CF0. Uh, uh, but however, um, voice, onset quality, uh, voice onset time, sorry, is uh, pretty solid and uh, with a, a um, a very clear difference. Uh, lastly, I would like to point out in these uh, tables the weird or the rare um, values of voice quality measurements for the uh, voiced stops in all of them. And because they, they point out that they might have breathy voice, and that is because uh, of considerable amount of the samples, as we can see in the percentages, have extended bots. That means with a, with a long, uh, considerably long duration, especially in the alveolar ones. Uh, so that means that a percentage of uh, the realizations of this phoneme are both voiced and um, aspirated. Mm, the expected results for the bilabial Adjective, I suppose there will be following the Villar. So I will, but I still, of course, need to take into account. I would love to hear your considerations on this. And I still need to integrate and double check the pre nasalized stop state analysis and interpretation. But I can see that there is a possible three way distinction, um, with the only exception of the, um, yeah, of the. Mm, yeah, alveolar, sorry, uh, of the alveolar prenatalized stops. Um, there is I think that there could be, but I still need to further dive into the um, uh, stops with non-aspiration to confirm. As for the clicks, uh, we can see that there's uh, way more um, regularity, but with less of a difference between those parameters when compared to the stops. So in the case of the dental and palatal alveolar clicks, all the exceptions can be explained uh, by the regularity of the rest of the values uh, that will be marked in uh, gray. And the alveolar, once more, is the one that poses more problems, especially in the adjective, um, because none of those values can be easily explained. And I have just stated them as an exception. Yeah. So as for expected results for the bilevial click, I really, if I'm 
completely honest, I have no idea what to expect. Um, but I will be very happy to hear your thoughts on this uh, because I think it will be very useful. And I still need to do pretty much all the uh, pre um uh, data analysis and interpretation. So I can't um, <clears throat> predict anything as happened with the stocks. And there is a point where I would love to hear your thoughts on this, uh, because I am really unsure about the back closure of the clicks, um, especially in the alveolar clicks, but also in the rest, uh, because I don't know if it does necessarily have to appear or if at least not in a phonemic st status. And then I don't know about the place of articulation. I'm, I'm not sure if it's velar, if it's post velar, if it's uvular. And uh, Richard actually sent an email and I received a lot of promising um, answers in which there is data that could be used to compare the tone position between um, the, um, the stop and the dorsal closure. So we could maybe um, see if it's actually velar or not. And then I would like to see if its articulation is affected by any accompaniment or vowel combination. Uh, maybe that will shed light on uh, if it's phonemic or phonetic. So as for the preliminary conclusions, um, uh, I found that laryngeal contrast, including asp uh, aspiration, are pertinent uh, uh, in both stops and clicks in Hatsa, although there is a shorter difference in uh, voice on the timing clicks when compared to the stops. Um, but that it shouldn't be very alarming since uh, voice on the time uh, has uh, problems um, from the three-way contrast on. And um, there is a sometimes problematic use of the SF0 and the voice quality measurements. In case of the S uh, of the um, um, consonant induced F0, uh, I suggest that a different way to measure it that I think would be more accurate. Uh, but I still haven't done that. I, I don't know if I should just measure everything again or just add it as a solution at the end. And as for the voice quality measurements, most of it can just be explained when uh, realizing that there's an allophone uh, for the voiced stops that is aspirated. Um, and I said allophone because I couldn't find any minimal pa minimum pairs, uh, although it appears almost exclusively in the intervocalic context. So, um, hand, yeah, um, for B and for G, it's uh, around the hundred percent, and around it for the um, alveolar stop. So I can conclude that uh, I think that there is a three-way contrast in stops preliminary to see if there could be uh, something happening with the um, ejectives, uh, which would be characterized by a more polarized results in their VOT measurements and higher consonant induced F0, but with no aspiration of breathy voice. And as for the click accompaniments, I found in my data glottalized, as, um, aspirated, simple, and preliminary, let's call it villarized. Um, however, I still have to determine um, the pre consonants to we'll probably find those, <laughs> and uh, the nature of the back closure to see if it's actually villarized or not. So these are the references, and thank you so much for your attention. Well, and thank you uh, very much, Alba, for a presentation that is clearly uh, very um, rooted in uh, the empirical data. It was, it was a real pleasure to, uh, to see. Um, now, uh, again, for questions and answers, uh, you can ask a voice question by raising your hand. Uh, in the Zoom module, or uh, following which I'll send an invitation to unmute. Uh, you can also ask a question in the chat, which I'll read out for the recording. And do, uh, once again, please remember that our uh, symposium is being recorded. Um, so if you do ask a question, this will be uh, part of the recording, which will be made available online. So uh, first things first, I see a hand up uh, from Bonnie Sands. So uh, Bonnie, why don't you uh, start us off? Why don't we let Ana Maria go first? <laughs> okay, sure. All right. Well, in that case, then we'll let Ana Maria go first. 
Uh, thank you, Bonnie. You could have asked first. I'm sure that your question would be much more uh, relevant than mine. So first, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I hope you know that you're doing a very, very, very important work in making all these measurements because this is the stuff that we really, really need to know. It those people that are studying uh, phonology, historical phonology, especially in Khoisan languages, which as we know are not a family, but anyway. So I was really impressed. I really liked your talk. Um, I don't know if you know that, but there's a bit of a discussion on uh, the number of contrasts you have in Eastern African Khoisan languages versus the ones you have in the typological area of uh, Southern African Khoisan. Now within Eastern Africa, have you considered looking at Sandawe as well? Or do you know anything how similar your results are to what typologically you find in Sandawe? Um, I did read about Sandawe, but uh, at the end I, I thought that my paper was long enough to have a comparison. But uh, what, what would you think it would be useful? Because you, you see some similarities uh, with my data? So the thing is that I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Ed uh, Elderkin, but he kind of uh, has this idea that there is a click profile, which would be click plus accompaniment or click contrast uh, that you find in Eastern African click language, which would be Sandawa and Hatsa, and versus what you would find in um, Southern African languages, which is mostly from the Kra and Tu families, because as you may know, there's this debate if the Kwekwadi is actually an Eastern African click language that intruded into Southern Africa. So uh, from that point of view, I think it would be really interesting to kind of um, embed your data maybe a little bit in, in the work of Ed Elderkin. Uh, I mean, not for now, because I, I see that your work is very complete, very impressive. But if you want to look at that more and maybe go a bit into the historical or comparative side of things, I think that you could make a very big contribution and answer some very big questions uh, with what you're doing there. Congratulations, really good. Oh, well, thank you so much. That, those are very nice comments to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I will I will really love to read more on that. I'm, I love historical um, linguistics, so that, that seems very promising. So if you have any references, uh, you can just write them down in the chat or um, yeah, I can just send you by email or whatever you might be more convenient for you. But thank you so much. No, I happily do that. I look at my stuff, but I'm sure that Bonnie has a, an even more complete bibliography on that, like she has on everything. So Bonnie. <laughs> that uh, serves as a good uh, way to segue to Bonnie, who has her hand up. Bonnie. Hi. So hi, thanks again for the talk. I, I definitely concur with Ana Maria that uh, doing these measurements is really Im important and it's a lot of work. And <laughs> but I, so my first, well, I have two questions if I if if uh, Andrew will allow me. The first is how did you do the VOT measurements? Because it's very hard with these noisy clicks to tell where the click ends and where aspiration begins. And so when I did the measurements in my paper, I did it from the onset of the consonant, which I think made the the aspirated clicks. As you say, they, they're not as aspirated. The VOT is not as different as it is for the non-clicks. And I think the fact that I measured VOT from the start of the consonant, because I had this problem of knowing where the end of the click was, because they're so noisy, that uh, that dorsal noise, right? So did, did you measure from the beginning of the consonant or from the end of the consonant? And if so, from how the, did you determine? Yeah, from the end of the consonant. And I just um, uh, sort of, uh, lurked at the, at the end of the um, release of the noise and from there on that's when I measured VOT. Right, see when I looked at many of those consonants, if I looked at the end of the release noise, I was pretty <laughs> So I... I can't I guess, see in your you paper. Know? Oh, Bonnie, sorry, you broke up there for a second. Do you mind repeating the last part of your uh, question there? Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, when a lot of times I will see noise all the way up until the vowel. So that criterion that you just described for me would give zero VOT in a lot of click cases. Now that might depend on how the recording was made, but if you were using uh, my recordings, that would be a little bit moot. And that, so that, that was my first question. Just consider putting that in the paper, examples of how you saw where that end is. Because there's the click end, the anterior burst end, and then there's the, the dorsal burst end. And 
Those are two different things. I can't hear Why? But, but here I, I couldn't because if not, I will be talking for a lot. But yeah, I also consider adding some uh, spectrograms uh, to see the measurements, but yeah, then it was just a lot. But yeah, I, I, will, I will take a deeper look and maybe in the paper, I will just add those if that would be useful. And then, so my second question is regarding the um, CF0 that you, I didn't really understand what it was about the alveolars that was off. But what I wanted to suggest is that it may be the vowels that are following because of the intrinsic F0 of different vowels. So especially like a, the aspirated T probably occurs before A a lot more where then the, the unaspirated might occur before E more. So if, you, if you're occurring before high vowels, you may have a higher F0 just due to the intrinsic F0 of those vowels. And I think the same with the, the aspirated alveolar click, I think that tends to occur before A ah much more often than um, high vowels. So just that imbalance in the data set might account for some of those differences in F0. Yeah, that would be very useful. That would be very useful because I, I F F zero was one of the parameters that got the most variability. So and I sometimes didn't know, especially in, in both alveolar sets in the stops and the clicks, I didn't know really how to account for that. But I will I will take a look at the at the vowels and I will see uh, the percentage of high vowels and A's or whatever other that I might find. But yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's my. That's all. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you both. Um, do we have any further questions or follow-ups? Didier, yes. Let me ask you to unmute yourself. Is that okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the very nice talk. I just have, a, it's not a real question. I have, well, it's a question and a suggestion. When you were mentioning that the VOT for the voiceless villa, uh, uh, let's say pneumonic and ejective were rather similar, uh, I think you should look at the noise that you have during the VOT because the noise during the, the ejective, uh, it, might, it, it might be without any noise during the, the VOT for the ejective because the glottis remains closed, remains closed. Well, you would have some noise with an open glottis during the pulmonic consonants. And that is, I think, the easiest uh, way to explain the thing. But I'm not sure that it's a good one, but it's a suggestion. Um, and then you were mentioning that you were, in your to-do things, uh, willing to look at pre-nasalized. Um, in fact, with Andrew Richard and my colleague Alain Guillaume, we recorded uh, nine speakers. Uh, with all the uh, a huge set of pre-nasalized consonants by using acoustics, EGG, oral airflow, and nasal airflow. If you want to have that, um, I will can pass it the data to you right now at night. I don't, I, not now, but at night I can give you that. So if you want to to make your hand on one speaker, I will just give you one speaker. If you want to have the nine speakers and be desperate after that, I give you the nine speakers. There's no problem. But I think that would be very useful. And frankly speaking, uh, with the, the huge set of data that Andrew, Richard, I, and I took and with Alain, we will never have the time to process that. So, so if you want to process that, I give you that gladly. And uh, it's as it is in your to-do list, you let me know and I will send you the, the data. That, so that, would be, that would be amazing. Okay, yeah. so it's all set then, I'll send you that. Uh, Give me, send me your email and then I will transfer that by your transfer. Thank you so Brilliant. much. My I will pleasure. take that. Brilliant. Somebody Brilliant. looking for data and data uh, needing somebody to look at. So that's a wonderful way to uh, finish.